From this point onwards, we have to walk. It's still early, so dewdrops linger on the leaves. Raddy Anna, stepping onto the lush green grass, moved forward. After about half an hour, Gino and Nico were breathless, while Raddy Anna seemed energetic and not at all tired. Gino was so exhausted that he exclaimed, We should have asked His Highness to provide us with a carriage to get everyone up here. Seeing Gino and Nico in such a state, Raddy Anna suddenly remembered earlier in the morning when Zaitio visited her room. While Raddy Anna was still half asleep, she felt the touch of Prince Ozatio's hound on her. Reflecting on this, she wondered why he had visited her at that time. However, the immediate concern was reaching their destination. Observing Gino's struggle, Raddy Anna called him, despite his irritable mood. Raddy Anna continued moving forward, and seeing Gino's distress, she knelt down and said, You can climb on my back. It will be easier. This unexpected gesture made Gino blush, and he hesitated, claiming he was too old for such things. However, facing the steep slope ahead, he reluctantly agreed. As Gino climbed onto Rady Anna's back, he remarked, This is an exception, Princess Rady Anna. It's because you have Karina with you that we've reached our destination so quickly. Gino pointed ahead and encouraged, Just cross that border and will be there. Karina, carrying Gino, quickly reached their destination. Nico admired Raddy Anna's kindness and Gino, now on the ground, urged them to move faster. Nico jokingly remarked, Sometimes Gino acts like an old man. Curious about Gino's age, Raddy Anna asked Nico. Nico hesitated, saying she wasn't sure, but Gino was at least 500 years old. This revelation shocked Raddy Anna. Despite the surprise, they continued to follow Gino towards the border of the empty land. Crossing the border, Raddy Anna saw a special pink light that dazzled her when she opened her eyes. In front of her was a centaur-like magus, with a human upper body and a horse lower body. Magus stared at Raddy Anna and then coldly spoke to Gino, questioning, if Raddy Anna was the mortal woman they had chosen. Gino assured Magus that Raddy Anna was intelligent and had a graceful appearance. Magus warned them to be cautious in this area as they didn't want to become prey. Gino anxiously asked if Magus understood that they intended for Raddy Anna to spend the first night with the Highness. Magus laughed it off, assuring them that as long as they stayed close to him, they wouldn't face any trouble. Magus led them into his magical cave, transforming the rocky and rugged entrance into a mystical, beautifully lit space. Inside, they found essential supplies and were offered hot deer thighs and cold beer by Magus. After Magus left, Raddy Anna commented on his kindness and Gino, still grumpy, criticized the simple hospitality they received after such a long journey. Nico, Observing the numerous scrolls in the corner of the cave, praised Magus as the wisest among the wise. The scene ended with admiration for the incredible collection of scrolls in Magus' possession. Gino chewed on the deer thigh with resentment, expressing his displeasure. He said, I've remembered all that knowledge for a long time. Observing Gino's expression, Riley Anna couldn't help but chuckle. Gino, annoyed, asked why she was laughing. Raddy Anna, eating, replied honestly, you looked quite cute just now. Gino, who had lived for hundreds of years, blushed at Raddy Anna's words. Nico teased him about being a charming deity, causing his face to turn as red as a cherry. Garina absent-mindedly glanced around the cave and suddenly noticed a mess on the table across from them. Scattered papers, pens, a knife, and even some fruits scattered everywhere. Raddy Anna commented, Looks like Magus has been busy lately. Gino, sipping his beer, nodded and admitted, I have to agree. He seems eccentric and mysterious, but there's no denying that he's the wisest scholar in Povius. Gino lay down on the ground and suggested, It seems like Magus is too busy right now. 
so we should take advantage of this time to rest. Nico, concerned, asked if Gino was joking about the Highness not wanting them to stay overnight. Raddy Anna, not as worried as Nico, cheerfully said, No worries, but before we sleep, there's something I want to do. She gathered dry branches into a pile. Meanwhile, back at Teka Palace, an intense and bloody trial was taking place. Ozatio, cold and ruthless, interrogated the messenger, accusing him of betraying the queen. Ozatio referred to him as Pusica, an advisor and the father of Ozatio's close friend. Raddy Anna, with a cold expression, watched the blood of Pico vanish on her hands. Ozatio, in a moment of callous laughter, suddenly looked towards Raddy Anna's room. Unaware of the events in the palace, Raddy Anna continued building a fire with dry branches in the cave. Little did she know that Prince Ozatio had used a magical spell to teleport to her location and was lying next to her. He gently looked at Raddy Anna, thinking about how she might find it difficult to meet his eyes like others. Ozatio's emotion surged and he moved closer, embracing Raddy Anna, resting her head on his warm chest. In that moment, Ozatio broke into a genuine smile, surrounded by the scent of fresh blood. The next morning, at the celestial garden of Teka Palace, a meeting was held among the goddesses of the royal family, Queen Avata Luman, of pure divine blood, and a direct descendant of the goddess Hera, sat in the middle of the feast table. The goddesses casually discussed the news that Ozatio had finally spent the night with a mortal woman. Queen Avatar, pleased, lifted her cup and said, I hope everyone will attend the royal celebration. Ozatio will marry the one we have chosen for him. Avatar glanced at her side, playfully asking her daughter T if she agreed. T, Avatar's granddaughter, blushed but maintained composure, saying they should go and offer their blessings. After Avatar delivered her message, she stood up and left the celestial garden with T. Once back at the Queen's temple, T couldn't contain her frustration and angrily tossed her crown to the ground. She complained about Ozatio choosing a woman from the Pai family, questioning how he could spend the first night with such an unknown woman. However, before T could say more, Queen Averta called her name and T, understanding her grandmother's implied message, calmly suggested that everyone should attend the royal celebration and witness Ozatio's feelings towards the chosen woman. As both women returned to the temple, T couldn't resist venting her displeasure at the choice Ozatio had made. Queen Avatar, however, remained cold and called her granddaughter's name, signaling the end of their conversation. After that, she gracefully sat on the throne reserved for the queen. The relaxed Avatar crossed her legs and spoke to T. You must remember my words carefully. Ozatio will marry you, and you have nothing to worry about. Currently, Ozatio is just a reliable companion of Sun, and I will do everything within my power to make it belong to you. At the same time, in the cave of the Magus deity, Nai was anxiously pacing back and forth next to Garina, who was on the verge of tears. What should we do? Lady Rati Anna is ill, and it's all because of that imperial court. The deity Gino's daughter fell ill because he had to carry her for a long distance. Gino was flustered and argued, I didn't force her to carry me. Hearing the commotion, the Magus deity approached, placing his hand on Raddy Anna's forehead and attributing her illness to exhaustion. He instructed Nye to prepare herbal tea with a hint of cinnamon to quickly restore her health. As Magus turned towards the kitchen, he was astonished to find it neatly arranged. It was a battlefield just a while ago, but Raddy Anna had cleaned it up, creating an orderly space. Meanwhile, a rain shower outside the cave worried Ne, who was pacing back and forth with Garina. Garina, on the verge of tears, exclaimed, What should we do? The next morning, the Toes Mountains experienced a lingering morning rain, nourishing the fresh sprouts. Inside the cave, Raddy Anna woke up to the sound of raindrops. Nico asked her how she felt, and Raddy Anna seemed to have recovered from her fever, 
Garina asked about Ozoshu's whereabouts, and Raddy Anna assumed he was in his palace. Upon remembering intimate scenes, Raddy Anna blushed, wondering if Ozoshu's visit last night was just a dream. As she looked around, Nico inquired about the water deity Gino, and Gino himself entered, mentioning that he brought something for Raddy Anna. He handed her a bunch of branches, saying, Here, Lady Raddy Anna, your favorite. Nico teased about the possibility of it being a mountain of hay instead, but Gino argued that he brought what she had requested. As the Magus deity returned to the cave, he took Raddy Anna to his workshop, where he used magic to turn silver threads into a beautifully patterned silver cup. Raddy Anna was amazed and wondered how he transformed the silver threads into the cup. Gino, impatient, urged Magus to help Raddy Anna become a goddess rather than a blacksmith. Magus, indifferent to their concerns, stated that people would see Raddy Anna as the descendant of Soko and accept her. He emphasized that she had learned the art of crafting from the goddess herself. Gino disapproved, but Magus remained unfazed, handing Raddy Anna a piece of silver and instructing her to follow his guidance. Raddy Anna, eager to learn something new, followed Magus's movements as he manipulated the silver threads. In a matter of seconds, the lifeless silver threads transformed into a beautiful silver flower. The exquisite beauty of the flower left Gino and Nico wide-eyed and speechless, marveling at its beauty. Seeing Raddy Anna's success in learning this skill, the Magus deity appeared visibly pleased. He smiled and said, your Highness visited me last night. I will do my best not to disappoint him. Upon hearing Magus's words, Raddy Anna's two hands stiffened, and even the silver rose in her hands turned into stone. Her cheeks blushed involuntarily, and her mind raced with thoughts. Did your Highness really come here last night? If it's not a dream, then those intimate scenes were real. The more I think about it, the more flustered I become. A few days later, in the Magus deity's cave, the rain persisted in the Toes Mountains. Raddy Anna stretched out her hands to catch the raindrops, and Gino was more concerned about the continuous rain. Magus, noticing Gino's worry, advised them to be patient. To combat the cold, Magus presented them with amber stones, explaining that these would keep their bodies warm. Gino and Nico appreciated the gesture, and Magus approached Raddy Anna, instructing her on some important points. He advised her not to let the others affect her emotions and to show a bit of warmth, as discussed earlier. Magus smiled and asked if she understood his intentions. Finally, the group, including Raddy Anna, had successfully completed the training in the Magus deity's cave. Despite the heavy rain, they had to leave. Gino, looking at the gloomy sky, muttered about not understanding why your highness was feeling down. Raddy Anna, confused, wondered how Ozeisho's mood could be related to the weather. As they hurriedly descended the mountain, a bright flash of lightning tore through the pitch-black sky. The sudden brilliance startled Raddy Anna, who screamed in fear. Gino, now more worried, commented on how they had never seen such a phenomenon during rain. Magus, unfazed, smiled and told them to be patient during the heavy rain, making it difficult to descend the mountain. He then opened a chest containing sunlight-soaked amber stones, providing each of them with one. A few days later the group, including Raddy Anna, finally returned to the Tesla Palace gate. Due to their haste, they were out of breath. Gino instructed Nico to take Lady Garina up the tower, while he went to talk to your highness. Raddy Anna was escorted by Disco to the back tower of the palace. Passing by a window, Raddy Anna hesitated for a moment. From there, she could see Ozeisho's shrine, but what struck her eyes was a shrine illuminated with a fiery red light. Garina, concerned, asked her to look that way, questioning if your highness was facing any trouble. Nico reassured her, stating that they often saw such light when it rained heavily. 
trying not to think too much, Raddy Anna still found it strange. However, she couldn't comprehend Ozatio's mood being related to the weather. As a normal person, she couldn't fathom the ways of the deity. Despite this, the closeness of the past few months had fueled Raddy Anna's curiosity about this man. And more importantly, Karina wanted to know why your highness wanted her life to last forever. Suddenly, a large lightning bolt illuminated the sky, tearing through the darkness. Nick was startled and shouted in fear. Gino, now even more worried, exclaimed, Your Highness, where are you? Seeing the bloodstains everywhere, he hastily inquired about Ozaisho's whereabouts. Finally, they found him lying lifeless against a stone wall. When Gino used his divine power, Ozaisho opened his eyes, weakly stating, Gino, the star. E. In a moment, Ozaisho's strength returned, and he looked at Gino with determination. Gino, concerned, urge Ozatio to meet the crown prince immediately, believing that the crown prince, with his pure bloodline, could resolve the situation. Ozatio, seemingly resigned, leaned against the cold stone wall. He expressed a sense of helplessness, indicating that meeting the crown prince wouldn't change anything. Ozatio looked at the blood-filled hall in front of him and uttered, Today is not a day of punishment, but I have ruthlessly slaughtered them without hesitation. So, please kill me when you have the chance. Kill the murderer that I am. Gino, in tears, insisted that your highness was not a murderer, emphasizing that he was the ultimate judge with the full power of Povius. Gino touched Ozatio and transmitted some divine power, then choked back tears and told Ozatio, You must go to meet my brother, Prince Status, immediately. You have to go fast if you want to return before the new moon. Despite his sense of helplessness, Ozatio had no choice but to follow Gino's instructions. In the blink of an eye, Ozatio vanished to find his younger brother Prince Status. After Ozatio left, Gino finally stopped crying. He sighed and said, How can Her Highness do this to Your Highness? She only wants peace. Verena, Pouring tea with trembling hands, asked, Isn't there any other way for your highness? Gino, wiping his tears, replied, Your highness has done everything. Now he can't do anything more. He had to go. Meanwhile, Raddy Anna was inside the tower, looking at the dark sky and the stormy scene outside. She reached out to touch the rain, but felt like something was blocking her. Darina explained that it was a magical shield preventing them from getting wet in the rain. Nico was outside, diligently brewing herbal tea with cinnamon for Raddy Anna. Nye, in response to Raddy Anna's concern, mentioned that due to the heavy rain, the Oracle had advised her to stay and wait for the rain to stop. Darina accepted the warm tea, hesitated for a while, and then asked about Her Highness. Nai calmly replied that your highness wouldn't come here for some time. After finishing the tea, Nico wished Raddy Anna a good night's sleep and left. Raddy Anna, feeling a heavy sadness, recalled Gino's words. Through them, she learned that Ozatio's mood was extremely bad, probably because something had happened at the shrine. In the meantime, Raddy Anna couldn't help but think about Ozatio. She remembered the warmth of his touch the sparkling lights when their lips met, and the weight of Isatio's body against hers. These memories were etched into her mind, and she blushed at the thought. Verena, standing near the window, touched the rain again. Although protected by magic, she could still see the shrine with its glowing red light. Raddy Anna wondered when Isatio would return. Raddy Anna, unaware of Isatio's inner torment, had inadvertently grasped some crucial information. She pondered on whether Ozatio was troubled by the recent events at the shrine, as Gino's anxious appearance suggested. The storm outside continued, and Raddy Anna couldn't shake off the image of Ozatio's handsome face and warm smile. As she slowly sipped the tea, she contemplated whether Ozatio would return soon. Back at the palace, 
Ozeishu appeared in the study of Prince Status Uman, a mature man with silver hair. Status, engrossed in a book, noticed Ozeishu's arrival through the mysterious dark aura. Leniently, he asked, Oyatio, I've told you before. Please inform me in advance so I can receive you properly. Why do you sneak in like a shadow? Ozatio transformed from water droplets into his usual form and remained silent for a while. Eventually, he coldly stated, I've lost control. Status stood up and approached Ozatio. With a hint of frustration, he asked, How many lives have you taken this time? After a moment of contemplation, Ozatio replied indifferently, I've lost count. Status, holding Ozatio's wrist tightly, asked if he had lost his sanity. The two locked eyes, and Status inquired further, suspecting that the Queen's intervention might be the cause. Ozatio just smiled faintly without answering, serving as evidence of his acknowledgement. Feeling helpless, Status sighed and suggested that Ozatio needed more than a jar of purifying water to cleanse the blood on his hands. He decided to fetch more water for Ozatio. As the conversation continued, Ozatio wondered if these actions would make things better for him. Even Status's divine power seemed ineffective on him now. Ozatio's hands had been stained with too much fresh blood. Ozatio's, with determination in her eyes, closed them tightly. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she thought about the horrifying negative events. In this moment of despair, the only person Ozatio could think of was the name Radi Anna. Ozatio opened his eyes again, his pupils darker than ever. He silently reproached himself for still thinking about a mortal woman at this time. He considered himself a fool. Seeing the indifferent attitude of his younger brother, Prince Status, couldn't help but feel discomfort and pity. He furrowed his brows and told Ozatio, You are the judge, but first and foremost, you are the Sun Prince, the Son of the Sun God. You cannot sentence those undeserving of death. If this continues, you will lose the power of the Sun, and your essence will gradually fade away, unless you want to become like Hades and live forever in the underworld. Ozashu's tears welled up again, and he felt helpless. He muttered to himself, realizing that even this might not save him. On the contrary, it would only increase the power of the Pyrot family in the heavenly court. Status, observing Ozatio's despair, suggested that he should consider Avarita's proposal. He advised Ozatio to accept and then think about the next steps. This, according to Status, was the only way for Ozatio to survive. Ozatio, displaying reluctance, asked Status if he wanted Califigo to ascend to the throne. However, Status was rather reserved on this matter. He sighed and expressed his satisfaction with ruling Lenito. He emphasized that any resistance against their father would be considered treason, and Ozatio should focus on saving himself. Ozatio's face revealed his unwillingness to accept his brother's advice. He mockingly said, If that's the case, then I am more than willing to rebel against our father. Early the next morning, Radi Anna was awakened by Gino's loud call. He announced that he had brought everything for her training, asking her to start practicing magic. Gino had even gone to great lengths to find silver and a metal melting furnace so that Radi Anna could craft items as part of her lessons from the Magus. Karina, astonished, questioned if Gino had received permission from His Highness Ozaishio. Gino, crossing his arms, confidently declared that he couldn't dance or sing, but had brought all the materials for Radi Anna to create exquisite silver crafts. Gino then summoned the water spirit Ni and handed her a stack of paper. He instructed her to read these poems to Lady Radi Anna while she practiced. Radi Anna, still half asleep, mumbled about being a mere mortal. Gino sighed and explained that she needed to pretend to be a goddess. If her true identity was revealed, all three of them would face the wrath of divine lightning. Karina, now realizing the severity of the situation, listened more attentively. 
She asked Gino what would happen once she successfully deceived everyone. Gino, looking uneasy, admitted that once Osatio no longer needed her, he would marry another woman, granting her freedom. Raddy Anna, trusting Gino, held his hand and asked if he was telling the truth. Gino, feeling awkward, hesitated before reluctantly stating that it seemed to be the case. When Rady Anna heard this, she felt her blood boil with excitement. She happily promised to work diligently and start immediately. Ten days passed since Rady Anna began her intense training. She had been tirelessly forging silver and memorizing poems. Nye, tired from staying up to read poems to Rady Anna, noticed dark circles forming around her eyes. Nye asked if Lady Rady Anna remembered the poems. Raddy Anna, with a determined smile, reassured me, I remember. I think I've memorized at least twenty scrolls by now. She eagerly waited for Nye's approval. Nye then handed her another stack of poems and suggested that she start practicing the verses she had learned. Raddy Anna, filled with excitement, asked if she could really become a goddess. Nye, with a hint of uncertainty, replied, We'll see. Raddy Anna quickly placed her training equipment down, then slowly immersed herself in reciting each line of poetry. Because of her intense focus, Raddy Anna didn't notice Nico becoming tense. Nico swiftly transformed into water and disappeared, leaving Raddy Anna engrossed in her poetry. In the room, another figure appeared, none other than Prince Osatio. He approached Raddy Anna, continuing to recite the poems she was so captivated by. Startled by the unexpected presence, Raddy Anna turned her head hastily, and indeed, behind her was the person she had yearned for day and night, Prince Osatio. Seeing Raddy Anna's astonished expression, Osatio smiled and asked if she had decided to become an enchanting blacksmith. Raddy Anna blushed for a moment, her entire body heating up. The silver flower on her hand flourished even more vividly due to the elevated body temperature. Vazatio approached her and complimented her dexterity. He gently took Raddy Anna's small hands, now marked with numerous red scars from her relentless silver forging practice. Vazatio marveled at Raddy Anna's fingers and assured her that he didn't want anything related to him causing her any harm. He lightly pressed Raddy Anna's hands against his face, advising her to pay more attention to this matter. Feeling her own chaotic heartbeat, Raddy Anna almost forgot the intoxicating scent that permeated the air and the oppressive feeling Osatio brought. Her rosy cheeks deepened, and in an instant, she thought of an important issue. What if Osatio took away her silver forging tools? Rady Anna hurriedly explained to Osatio that they wouldn't cause any harm, and she would be more careful. Osatio, uninterested, walked to the sofa and sat down. He crossed his legs and told Rady Anna to continue. He would remain silent. Rady Anna felt a bit awkward. She didn't want Osatio to discover that she was doing this for him. She continued forging silver, trying to keep Osatio waiting. Meanwhile, Osatio found himself pondering on the events at his brother Status Lenito Palace. He had declared that he was willing to rise up against their father, challenging the sun god Soliman. Thinking about it again, Osatio felt even more disheartened. Although he had said such words to his brother, Osatio had no real interest in rebellion or opposing their father. Lost in his thoughts, Osatio looked at Raddy Anna's slender figure and her light blonde hair. His eyes were somewhat dreamy, and he couldn't help but find it amusing. When he thought about Raddy Anna, his troubled mind strangely found peace. On the way back to Lenito Palace, Osatio questioned his own feelings. Was it because of Raddy Anna that he felt a sense of tranquility? Or was it the way she walked? or the fragrance that lingered after she left. Osatio was unsure, but whenever he remembered those small moments, his chaotic mind inexplicably found peace. Back in Raddy Anna's room, 
she continued diligently forging silver. She wanted to ask Ozacio why the rain had been pouring continuously for many days and why he seemed so tired. However, she knew she didn't have the right to boldly inquire about these things. Lost in her thoughts, Raddy Anna suddenly remembered Nico's words that to get married, the son of the sun god had to experience it for the first time. Apart from Ra, Queen Avatar was eagerly planning Ozacio's marriage. The people and the Pirot family had long had their eyes on the third prince, Ozacio. Raddy Anna couldn't help but think about the morning when Ozacio had told her to become stronger to endure him. She blushed at the thought and wondered why Ozacio had chosen her. Perhaps tonight she and Ozacio would truly experience that first time. In the midst of her wandering thoughts, Raddy Anna accidentally let her hand touch the hot metal rod. The sudden pain brought her back to reality, and she let out a small cry. Immediately, Azacio, who had been silently observing, called her name and narrowed his eyes. He looked at her and told her to come closer. Raddy Anna, feeling a bit flustered, insisted that it was nothing and that it was just a small injury. Vizacio's tone didn't reveal any emotions as he said he could smell the scent of slightly burnt flesh. He asked her to come closer, and Raddy Anna, without daring to refuse, approached and placed a hand in Vizacio's larger hand. Ozacio observed a reddish glow on Raddy Anna's hand and furrowed his brows, commenting that it looked quite painful. Gently, Vazatio placed a kiss on the injured area, advising her to quickly heal the wound. Just then, Ozacio sensed something approaching the Ticker Palace due to his abilities and the ability to read others' thoughts. He knew that the royal envoys were flying over this way. Worriedly, Ozacio thought that this was not the right time, as the envoys might detect the scent of a mortal from Rady Anna's burn. To conceal it, Ozacio decided to use his own scent. He slowly spoke, using his eyes to convey to Raddy Anna that they should continue their unfinished business. Raddy Anna immediately blushed, feeling a deep sense of confusion. She wondered if Ozacio intended for them to proceed right there and then. Before Raddy Anna could respond, Ozacio gently lifted her up, teasing her about her flushed face. Raddy Anna stammered, explaining that it was due to the intense heat from the forge. Vazatio leaned in and placed a comforting kiss on the reddened spots around Raddy Anna's eyes. He softly intertwined his fingers with hers, looking into her eyes. Raddy Anna, feeling uncertain about what to do next, noticed that Ozatio didn't make any further moves. Trying to break the awkward silence, she asked if there was anything displeasing to him. Ozacio, seemingly unsure how to proceed, sighed and said he didn't understand what she was thinking. However, before he could finish, Raddy Anna confidently stated that she understood. She questioned if he wanted her to take the initiative to kiss him first. Ozacio was surprised by her straightforwardness but approached her, smiling, and agreed to go along with her intentions. At that moment, in the heavenly palace where the sun god resided, Emperor Son Lumen and Queen Avatar were engaged in conversation. Avatar was desperately trying to persuade Son Lumen, asking when Califigo would return. However, Son Lumen was cold and indifferent, mentioning the cries of the goddesses slain by Califigo. Avatar attempted to defend Califigo, but Son Lumen pointed out that Califigo had committed the crime of killing a noble girl. In response to Avatar's plea to allow Califigo to return for the upcoming Moonblade Festival, Son Lumen declared that his wrath wouldn't subside for over a thousand days. He explicitly stated that Califigo wouldn't be allowed to return, causing Avatar to attempt to use her charm to change his mind. Back in the Ticker Palace, Ozatio continued to confront Raddy Anna about her unwillingness to proceed. Instead of making any further moves, he froze, observing Raddy Anna's confused expression. Raddy Anna, sensing his hesitation, decided to comply with his request, fearing that Gino and Nico might face danger if she didn't. 
Osatio, unsure of how to proceed, let out a sigh. Raddy Anna, taking the initiative, boldly stated that she understood and assumed he wanted her to kiss him first. Osatio, surprised by her statement, gently approached her, smiling, and affirmed that they would proceed as she wished. At the same time, in the celestial realm, news arrived that Prince Status Lumen had come to meet Emperor Sun Lumen. After obtaining permission, Status entered, greeting his father with respect and expressing hope for Sun Lumen's well-being. He kissed Queen Aveta's hound politely, and Aveta seized the opportunity to initiate a conversation with Status, attempting to discuss Califigo's return. However, Son Newman cut short Avatar's attempts and dismissed her. Avatar reluctantly accepted and left the presence of Son Newman and Status. Sensing the discomfort, Son Newman waved his hand, signaling Avatar to leave. Once Avatar exited the heavenly realm, Son Newman slowly questioned his son, Status, about his unexpected visit. Son Newman found Status' demeanor unusual and asked about his purpose. Status remained silent for a moment before revealing that he came to talk about Ozatio. Son Lumen, visibly displeased, stated that he didn't want to hear anything about that judge. Status, with a cold tone, inquired about why Ozatio was being trained and disciplined in such a manner. Son Lumen, seemingly indifferent, questioned why Status didn't stop the Queen from interfering and mentioned that Pogical was already on the execution list for her actions. However, Son Lumen revealed that Ozatio's actions and powers were causing an imbalance in the heavenly realm, and he intended to maintain that balance. Son Lumen tightened his grip on his robe, asserting that Ozatio's strength was disrupting the equilibrium, and that's why Ozatio was being raised that way. Status then asked about Queen Avajita's involvement, and Son Lumen, aware of the truth, chose not to respond directly. He insisted that maintaining balance was essential, and Rosatio was not fit to inherit his role. Status countered, questioning why Rosatio couldn't be allowed to face Califigo. Son Lumen, unyielding, stated that it wasn't the time, and he didn't want to hear about it. Status expressed his desire for Califigo to have a chance to confront Ozatio, but Son Lumen remained unmoved, asserting that he wouldn't jeopardize the balance for personal interests. Son Lumen further dismissed Status's concerns, mentioning that his son's kindness couldn't restore the balance. Status, in frustration, confronted his father about his sudden change in demeanor. He referred to Ozatio's bloodied hands, blaming Son Lumen for giving such orders. Son Lumen, angered, asserted that Ozatio was created to be a judge, and that if he didn't fulfill that role, the balance would be completely disrupted. Despite Status' efforts to reason with Son Lumen, the Sun God remained adamant. Son Lumen warned Status not to mention Ozatio in his presence again, emphasizing the consequences of challenging his decisions. Meanwhile, in the Tikka Palace, Ozatio and Raddy Anna were discovered by Gino. Gino, visibly concerned, questioned Ozatio about his actions, urging him to put Raddy Anna down. Ozatio, trying to downplay the situation, mentioned that they were just doing what couples normally do. Gino, while restoring Raddy Anna's strength, sternly instructed Ozatio not to approach her, touch her, or do anything before the Moonblade Festival. Bozatio, somewhat irritated, asked if Gino was giving him orders. Gino, angered, reminded Ozatio that he knew the consequences of breaking the rules and that he had refrained from such behavior for two centuries. Gino insisted that this situation had gone out of control, expressing his frustration with Ozatio's reluctance to engage in such activities before. As tension escalated, Gino emphasized that he knew this would happen sooner or later, even though Ozatio had been reserved for two centuries. The atmosphere in the celestial realm became tense as dark clouds covered the sky, causing concern for Gino. He continued to warn Ozatio about the potential consequences of his actions, 
stressing that the situation was spirally out of control. Ozatio was somewhat annoyed by Gino's tone, so he decided to burn a strand of Gino's hair. Gino panicked and cried out, but after this mild punishment, Ozatio calmly sat down beside Raddy Anna's bed. He gently stroked each strand of Raddy Anna's hair, even smelling the sweet fragrance from her. With a smile, he told them to say whatever they wanted as he didn't care, because in the end, she belonged to them. The next morning, Raddy Anna woke up to the sound of birds singing in the garden. As she opened her eyes, she was drenched in sweat, resembling someone who had just experienced a terrifying nightmare. Sitting up, she felt sore and fatigued, as if something had weighed on her all night. Naturally, she knew what she and Azatio had done the day before. She looked at her hands, wondering if she had become immortal. Her entire body seemed to sparkle, as if covered in gold. Could this be a result of what she did with Azatio last night? Just then, Nico entered the room with a basket of fruits, asking the Garina young lady if she was okay since she seemed unusually quiet. Raddy Anna, while showing her hand to Nico, mentioned that there was something strange about her body, shimmering as if it were gilded. Nico nodded in agreement. Suddenly, Raddy Anna sensed Zatio's aura. In an instant, she transformed into a droplet of water and disappeared. Even in this state, she could perceive her surroundings more sensitively than before. She could feel that Prince Ozatio was standing behind her, a sensation she had never experienced before. Ozatio lifted the curtain and mentioned the essence he left was spreading throughout her body. Advising her to drink more golden water, he warned of excruciating pain if she didn't. Ozatio reached out to pull the blanket off Raddy Anna, but she resisted. They playfully tugged at the thin blanket, and Rosatio, with an amused tone, asked her why she was doing this. Raddy Anna, embarrassed, replied that she was just cold. Rosatio then sat down next to her, gently embracing her slender waist, leaning his face against her blushing cheek. After inhaling the sweet fragrance, Rosatio couldn't resist and planted a gentle kiss on Mozardiana. At that moment, Gino walked in, witnessing the intimate scene. Unable to contain himself, he exclaimed, warning Ozatio not to do such things. Ozatio, irritated, released Raddy Anna, explaining that it was just a kiss. Turning to Raddy Anna with a fond look, he empathized with her fear of the cold and assured her it didn't matter. Gino, frustrated, reminded Ozatio of his warnings, but Ozatio seemed unfazed, even prompting Gino to bring a golden water cup for Raddy Anna. As Raddy Anna reluctantly drank the golden water, she felt a discomfort that made her frown. Gino explained that Ozatio had added a lot of his solar energy to her body. Ozatio approached, patting Raddy Anna's back to make her feel better, jokingly mentioning that she should drink more or endure severe pain. He then signaled Nico to summon the water spirit. Nico appeared promptly, receiving orders to monitor Raddy Anna's daily intake of golden water until they visited the sacred temple. After Nico acknowledged the command with respect, Ozatio whispered to Raddy Anna, advising her to follow his instructions. Despite the unpleasant taste, Raddy Anna diligently consumed the golden water, feeling discomfort after each sip. Reflecting on the day, she couldn't help but pity Ozatio, acknowledging Nico's hard work under Ozatio's guidance. Following Ozatio's directions and Nico's vigilant supervision, Raddy Anna consistently consumed the golden water. Each time she finished a cup, she felt unbearable discomfort, but she knew that this peculiar water was crucial for her survival. Beside her, Nai smiled, telling her she had worked hard that day. Raddy Anna, chuckling, responded that it was nothing. In reality, she felt sorry for Ozatio, as Nico had worked diligently. Ozatio had mentioned that Raddy Anna's body was infused with his solar energy, and the shimmering effect was evident after every drink. Raddy Anna, observing Nico for a moment, 
suddenly expressed a desire to make a cute hairpin for her. Taking a silver ring, she began forging it into a hairpin, and a female spirit manifested, startling Raddy Anna. After regaining her composure, she continued with her creation. Raddy Anna hesitated before asking why the maidens had come. One by one, they took her forging equipment, claiming that they were sent by Prince Osatio to clear anything that might harm her. In a blink, all the items used for Raddy Anna's training disappeared, leaving no trace. Nico, angered to the point of tears, expressed her frustration, saying they even took the hairpin that the Magus had given to Miss. Raddy Anna, however, seemed accustomed to this and reassured Nico that there was nothing to be sad about. Later, outside the Tekka Palace, Nico, while massaging her chilly shoulders, wondered why Chino called her at this hour. As Nico looked around, she suddenly noticed a sparkling object underneath. Recognizing it as Raddy Anna's hairpin, she quickly picked it up. Chino's voice echoed in the air, saying he had enchanted the hairpin, making it invisible to everyone, even the servants and Prince Ozacio. Upon hearing this confirmation from Gino, Raddy Anna couldn't help but feel a mix of sadness and relief. Nico swiftly collected the precious item, not wanting Raddy Anna to be upset. While the maids left the room, they hid behind pillars to observe Raddy Anna's reactions. Nico, with two blowing branches, approached Raddy Anna, saying she would apply scented oil to her entire body after she bathed. She emphasized the importance of looking dignified, as Raddy Anna would attend the festival as the prince's companion. The next morning, as the first rays of sunlight emerged, Nico continued preparing Raddy Anna in her room. Gino, on the other hand, rushed in and wondered why they were taking so long. Osatio, observing, realized that Raddy Anna's vulnerability as a mortal concerned him. He contemplated whether she could withstand the challenges as a goddess. Despite his worries, Osatio couldn't help but smile at the thought, acknowledging that he needed to be prepared emotionally in case his father, Son Lumen, rejected Raddy Anna. As Raddy Anna approached, the graceful foot adorned with exquisite floral shoes stepped into view. Nico had dressed her in the most dazzling gown, enhancing her appearance as a true goddess in Povius. The enchanting beauty even left Gino in awe, while Osacio, witnessing this transformation, was momentarily stunned. He told Raddy Anna to allow him to admire her thoroughly. The goddess-like Raddy Anna, under Nico's careful attention, walked into the room, catching everyone's attention. Her presence was so captivating that Gino was left gaping, and Osatio found himself frozen by her enchanting form. Osatio, attempting to compose himself, asked Raddy Anna to let him appreciate her beauty more closely. Raddy Anna slowly approached Osatio, who gazed at her and then offered a gentle smile, praising her ability to deceive others into thinking she was a goddess. Osatio's compliment caused Raddy Anna's cheeks to flush red. Once everything was prepared, Raddy Anna's group headed towards the harbor where their means of transport awaited them to reach the celestial realm for the Swordfish Festival. As they boarded the ship, Raddy Anna noticed a Black Panther figure on board and wondered if there was a statue on the ship. Osatio, sensing her curiosity, informed her that it was her first Black Panther unfortunate to have only a century of life. He then remarked that Raddy Anna would live longer, having survived the infusion of solar essence into her body. Bozatio waited for Raddy Anna's response, but received none. He approached her, gently asking her to speak. Raddy Anna, feeling awkward, complimented the beauty of the statue on the ship. Bozatio teasingly asked if that was all, and he playfully lifted her chin calling her name softly. He mentioned how she seemed different from their first meeting, more composed and less impulsive. Raddy Anna blushed and tried to force a smile, but Ozatio continued, stating that she should let the world know she was his first woman. As they disembarked, he warned her not to display the same attitude in Povius 
and emphasized that she would play the role of his lover. Visatio suggested they start training, and Raddy Anna, trying to change the subject, asked if they could chat for a bit. Nico, at Raddy Anna's side, was holding her hand, and Raddy Anna nervously questioned her about love. Nico enthusiastically responded that she had experienced love and compared it to the breath of the gods, encouraging Raddy Anna to listen to her heart's feelings. Therina, curious, asked Nico how to look at someone with eyes full of love. Nico, struggling to explain, touched her chin, suggesting that it was not something she had thought deeply about. Then Barina chokingly asked Raddy Anna if she had ever been in love, and Nico jumped in, saying she could tell them her stories. Nico claimed that love was like the god's breath, and if your heart trembled, that was love. Farina, eager for details, asked Nico how to look at someone with overflowing love. Nico, puzzled, rubbed her chin, admitting she hadn't really considered it. Raddy Anna, distracted by the conversation, recalled the most beautiful, splendid, and fantastic thing she had ever seen. Suddenly, the image of Prince Osatio appeared in her mind, with his broad shoulders and captivating appearance. Raddy Anna blushed, not understanding how her thoughts had turned to Osatio at that moment. Feeling embarrassed, she tried to avoid the topic, but Karina teased her, causing Raddy Anna to become flustered. Once aboard the ship, Raddy Anna hesitated, feeling the need to escape. In an attempt to focus, she reminded herself that she had to be more composed, as there was no way to avoid this any longer. Osatio, as he had stated earlier, expected her to portray the image of a goddess deeply in love with him. Raddy Anna, trying to concentrate, tightened her grip on Nico's hand, knowing that her only option was to stay focused, even if she couldn't escape the situation. As Ozashu patiently waited for Raddy Anna to express her feelings, he couldn't read her thoughts and didn't understand the turmoil in her heart. With a smile, he moved closer to her, gently lifting her chin and calling her name. Ozatio expressed his hope that Raddy Anna had used the time to practice, teasing her about making a god wait. However, when Raddy Anna, despite her efforts to appear affectionate, met Ozatio's gaze with eyes full of love, he was displeased. Ozatio expressed his disappointment, stating that he had expected her to be more moved by his beauty. Raddy Anna, feeling anxious, tried to gather her thoughts but struggled. Ozatio, appearing slightly saddened, commented on her apparent disappointment, urging her to show more emotion. Trying to divert the situation, Raddy Anna approached Ozatio, speaking softly and admitting that she was amazed by his beauty. Ozatio, seemingly unsatisfied, gently embraced Raddy Anna, expressing his wish for her to be more emotional, as he believed she could do better. Raddy Anna, feeling overwhelmed, apologized to Ozatio. The scene ended with Raddy Anna feeling uncertain about her ability to fulfill the role Ozatio expected her to play. Ozatio turned his head to look at Raddy Anna, but as soon as his eyes met hers, he couldn't look away. Raddy Anna's current expression and gestures conveyed indescribable emotions, a feeling of overflowing affection. Raddy Anna, blushing, asked Ozatio if he found her pose acceptable. Ozatio was momentarily stunned, unable to articulate anything. After a while, he smiled and asked Riley Anna to maintain that pose until they reached Povius. During the continuous day and a half journey to Povius, Karina occasionally leaned over the railing to enjoy the drifting clouds below. Gino approached Raddy Anna and began explaining the details. Povius and Tichka were located at opposite ends of the heavenly realm. Gino emphasized the need for caution in Povius, a place significantly different from the Electric Palace. A minor mistake could lead to discussions about her by the empires. Verena, sensing Raddy Anna's tension, provided additional encouragement. Gino reminded Raddy Anna to play the role of Ozaisho's deeply enamored lover to survive in Povius. 
Although guiding Reddy Anna, Gino was also fearful, unable to hide his own apprehension. He urged Raddy Anna to understand the importance of staying close to Ozatio. As they approached Povius, Ozatio lay on the ship's deck, unable to divert his gaze from Raddy Anna's eyes filled with love. Each time he closed his eyes, he remembered Raddy Anna's captivating expression, smiling involuntarily. However, Ozatio felt a mix of emotions, acknowledging that Raddy Anna might not genuinely love him now. In the midst of sorting out his confused thoughts, Ozatio heard Raddy Anna's soft call. Raddy Anna approached him, gently lifting her hair to reveal her neck. With eyes full of affection, she asked if she could once again receive his consent. Unable to resist Raddy Anna's expression, Ozatio, despite his earlier attempts to remain composed, nodded in agreement. Ozatio extended his hand to gently stroke Raddy Anna's hair, then smiled, wishing her good luck. Soon after, noisy cheers erupted from afar, drawing Raddy Anna's attention to the harbor, where people enthusiastically hailed Prince Ozatio, the eternal judge of Povius. Despite the admiration, Raddy Anna only saw Ozatio's solitary figure, seemingly reluctant to accept the praises. Ozatio turned back to glance at Raddy Anna, offering a smile devoid of clear emotions. He bid her farewell and disappeared. Raddy Anna remained dazed, recalling Ozatio's recent demeanor. Meanwhile, in the Queen's Palace tea, the granddaughter of the West family was furious, breaking numerous valuable jewelry items. T scolded her servants demanding they find something even more dazzling to attract Prince Ozatio's attention. Avatar, annoyed by T's words, questioned her actions. T replied that she needed to present the best gems to Prince Ozatio at the festival. Avatar, sarcastically, asked if T feared losing to the foolish spirit she had brought. Ignoring the tension, Avatar instructed the maids to quickly prepare T. As T reluctantly picked up a dazzling gem, Avatar coolly reminded her to consider the growing child within her. Avachita, the midwife, brought the gem close to T and casually mentioned that besides herself, T should also think about the child growing within her. The comment left T pale and stunned, realizing the implications. Avachita continued, urging T to control her temper. As the scene unfolded, Raddy Anna was still lost in thoughts of Ozatio's recent behavior. Avajita, sensing T's extreme fear, interrogated her, asking about the child. T, confused, claimed ignorance, but Avajita slapped her ears with a piece of cloth, causing pain. Avajita, with a cold and menacing gaze, accused T of lying and implied that T wanted her child to die upon birth. Avajita questioned, whether T desired her child to be raised with the title of the Sun Prince. T, terrified, was unable to refute Avajita's words, who continued to warn her. Avajita handed back the dazzling gem and warned T that it was her final warning. She emphasized that T must deceive the judge of the heavens and hinted that winning Ozatio might save her lover and her child. T, angered and determined, vowed to use any means to win Prince Ozatio. Meanwhile, in the palace of the sun deity, a spatial crack appeared, and the guards immediately reported that Prince Ozatio Lumen had arrived. Ozatio, emerging from the crack, faced the excited crowd, with many warning about the presence of Angelum. Ozatio finally stepped out entirely and stood before the sun deity. Son Luman Ozatio greeted his father, acknowledging the hope that he was well. Son Luman responded with cold indifference, and Ozatio, maintaining composure, mentioned that he had finally lost his virginity. The atmosphere within the palace became tense, and the smell of gunpowder permeated the air. The crowd started gossiping about the shocking revelation Ozatio made. Queen Avota, Intrigued, praised Ozatio for such a fantastic achievement. Ozatio glanced at her, making a sarcastic comment about the apparent delight in such matters. Ozatio, 
with status at his side, took his seat as the Prince of the Sun, while Avatar inquired about Status' wife, Vicasia. Status, smiling, revealed that she had given birth. Aveta joyfully exclaimed that the prince had welcomed his first child. Aveta then turned her attention to her primary target, Ozatio, and casually asked when he would introduce the girl he took away on his first visit. Ozatio, nonchalant, assured that she would arrive shortly. Avajita, seizing the opportunity, introduced T as the Perot family's granddaughter, originally intended to be Ozatio's fiancé. T, trying to appear graceful and gentle, greeted Ozatio respectfully. However, Ozatio, seemingly indifferent, merely glanced at her before turning away. T felt a chill down her spine, realizing that her elaborate plans might not be effective. Ozatio suddenly stood up, surprising Status, who questioned his actions. Ozatio casually mentioned that he believed his love had arrived. A hushed silence fell over the palace as Ozatio announced the presence of Radiana. Gino entered the palace first, followed by Radiana, whose beauty illuminated the entire hall. Ozatio approached her, wrapping his arms around her slender waist, exchanging loving glances. Whispering into Radiana's ear, Ozatio hinted at using her magic. Ozatio then turned to the assembly, addressing Sun Lumen and stating that it was time to use Raddy Anna's magic. The scene shifted to the reaction of the crowd. The palace was filled with anticipation as Raddy Anna, with Ozatio by her side, stood before the sun deity and the entire celestial court. Sun Lumen sternly instructed Ozatio to lower his hand. Ozatio complied, revealing the beautiful purple hue form of Raddy Anna, captivating everyone present. Raddy Anna greeted Sun Lumen respectfully, identifying herself as the goddess Raddy Anna, a descendant of the ancient deity Suko. Sun Lumen, unimpressed, asked her to demonstrate her abilities to prove her divine lineage. Karina, confident, faced the challenge and confidently declared that she would create something using silver threads. Queen Avatar, observing Raddy Anna's hairpin closely, remarked on the significance of the silver flower crafted by Magus, the court magician. Without hesitation, Karina approached the materials needed for silver forging, including a furnace and hammer. The palace residents, curious and intrigued, wondered what Raddy Anna had learned from Magus. Karina skillfully worked with the silver, impressing the onlookers with her mastery. After a brief time, Raddy Anna presented a beautiful silver rose enchanting everyone with its beauty. She graciously offered the silver flower to Sun Lumen, who, with a hint of indifference, accepted it. Sun Lumen acknowledged Raddy Anna as Suko's descendant, but shifted his attention to Ozatio. Sun Lumen, aware of Ozatio's past affection for Raddy Anna, suggested that Ozatio should marry T as soon as possible. Ozatio, seemingly indifferent to Sun Lumen's advice, Agreed, stating that if the gods willed it, he would follow through. Queen Avatar, pleased with Azatio's response, inwardly celebrated. With the necessary introductions and formalities completed, Son Lumen officially declared the commencement of the festival. The crowd erupted in cheers, and the atmosphere became lively with the festivities. The revelers indulged in wine, enjoying the celebration until the appearance of the sun, Amidst the joyous atmosphere, Raddy Anna couldn't help but continuously glance upwards where Vazatio stood. Though Zatio, reciprocating Raddy Anna's gaze, smiled tenderly, and the two seemed immersed in their love. However, Raddy Anna suddenly felt the piercing gaze of someone else. She turned to find T, the granddaughter of Queen Avatar, with flowing brown hair, glaring at her. T, driven by jealousy and the desire to win Ozatio, had an unfriendly and hostile expression. Raddy Anna, sensing the negative energy, recognized T as a potential rival, but remained unaware of the depth of T's animosity and schemes. T, feeling the pressure of the situation, struggled to maintain her composure. 
Raddy Amma's calm demeanor and Garina's unwavering support intensified the tension. Sensing the hostile atmosphere, Gino intervened, urging T to drop the matter and avoid confrontation. T, unwilling to back down, retorted, insisting that Raddy Anna had taken Ozacio's virginity before her. Verena, angered by T's accusations, confronted her and warned against making false claims. The conflict escalated, and T continued to taunt Raddy Anna about her alleged involvement with Ozacio. Raddy Anna, refusing to be provoked, addressed T calmly, describing the scenario in a seductive manner. She mentioned waiting for Rosatio to arouse her desires and then surrendering herself in his arms, leaving T astonished by her audacity. Garina supported Raddy Anna, emphasizing that if T sought more details, she could inquire any time. As Garina concluded her statement, a tense silence enveloped the area. The confrontation between Raddy Anna and T reached its peak, with both sides holding their ground. The festival atmosphere, once vibrant and joyful, now carried an undercurrent of animosity and drama. The spectators eagerly awaited the outcome of this unexpected clash between the aspiring queen and the goddess.